All right, so I came on to my current team uh, at Zendesk when we were in the middle of the big rewrite. Maybe you've been there before. Uh, we were going from a server-side uh, rendered app and a traditional kind of Rails JSON API uh, and buying all in to the Facebook stack. We really wanted to use GraphQL and Relay and React because these are new and exciting and fun. Uh, and also to try out some uh, new technologies that might be suited to the rest of the company. But as it turns out, we were sort of taking off and still putting on the wings. Uh, my name is Jason Suarez, and I'd like to start by thanking my employer, uh, Zendesk, although all the opinions in my talk uh, are mine exclusively. Uh, I'd also like to thank Tom and the organizers. Everyone's done a fantastic job here. Um, the staff and designers and architects and construction workers for this amazing building that we're in. Um, it's truly a tribute to a heritage and uh, art and culture that I think is uniquely uh, American. Uh, I'd also like to thank the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest whose land we stand upon uh, and may we'll continue to learn from their example, uh, protecting communities and natural environments that sustain us. So GraphQL, what is that? Uh, well, let's find out. The thesis of my talk is that GraphQL is API pop culture. But how do we define that? It turns out that that's kind of a tricky thing to do as well. Historian Holt Parker says, that perhaps the best way to define and choose among competing definitions uh, for pop culture is to see what pop culture is being cut off from, what it's set apart from. What isn't it? Uh, pop culture is at least always oppositional. So let's compare GraphQL and see what else is in the field uh, that it maybe stands apart from. Let's look at a couple of different styles of APIs that are not GraphQL. Let's start with RPC. Uh, RPC is not necessarily fun or cool anymore, but uh, it's actually the underpinnings of almost every system uh, that we use. Uh, and often our projects end up implementing some sort of form of RPC without us really realizing it uh, or recognizing it explicitly. Um, one of the things that it can benefit from is that it's extremely, uh, or it can be extremely efficient. Uh, oftentimes databases uh, use this uh, for their native protocols. Here's an example of uh, JSON RPC. We have uh, essentially a method that we're calling, some uh, parameters that we're passing into it, and then we might get a result back that looks something like this. Uh, it's a really fancy way to subtract a couple of numbers. One of the downsides is all the flexibility that we have with this is complexity that goes into your application. It's things that you have to worry about when you're trying to manage that. It also introduces a really tight coupling between your clients and your servers. A Couple of numbers, uh, we're good at working with numbers. These are things we should also think about in addition to API styles. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Danielle Leong, an engineer at GitHub for bringing some of these stats to my attention. So REST APIs are something that we're all familiar with. Uh, this is what a request might look like for our user number 15. We might get a response back that looks something like this. REST is great. Um, it's highly normalized. It's extremely easy for us to implement these servers. Uh, there's a lot of frameworks that have kind of explored this space really well. Uh, you could write things really, really quickly. What this ends up doing when you are a product and feature developer is pushing some of this complexity onto the client. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of times this also has bad performance implications, especially if you have N plus one queries where you have to request one resource, wait for that to come back, and then issue several other requests uh, and be composing all of that at the client level. These are things that make your website slow and users don't like that. A lot of times, you'll be overfetching data. Maybe you don't care about the pets at all. We just want some names so you could display a whole big list. OData is an extension on top of REST. Uh, it's a specification put out by Microsoft. I haven't really seen it used uh, much outside of the .NET community, but I think it's interesting in comparison to GraphQL. It tries to address some of those things that we saw with REST. Uh, it adds this ability. It almost looks um, RPC-like at first, where we're kind of passing in this username as a parameter to people. Uh, it adds some capabilities, like a standardized way of filtering on sort of arbitrary predicates, as long as it's supported by the server. Here, we're uh, getting 
uh, uh, records back where the emails end with a certain domain name. Uh, and it also gives us the ability to have projection. Just like in SQL, we could select individual fields that uh, are coming back, and this is what our response might look like. And in our case, we also are using this expand uh, command, which will go out and do that join and get you uh, the additional friends for this particular record. Now we see that the result is pretty verbose. Uh, it's, it's strongly typed. Um, what this ends up meaning is that there is sort of a lot of tooling that you have to use around OData. And so, like I mentioned, it's well supported in the Microsoft ecosystem, but it might be a little bit harder to use um, if you have other stacks. Uh, so, Sparkle. Has anyone here used Sparkle? <laughs> awesome. We got at least one. Uh, Sparkle is really, really neat. I like it a lot. Um, but it's seen as really academic. Uh, it has kind of a strong theoretical framework behind it, but you have to know a lot of other concepts and terminology to use it effectively. Um, the trade-off for that is that you get a lot of power. We could express queries here that uh, it would be pretty much unthinkable uh, to run um, in other types of APIs that we were looking at. Uh, for example, in this case, we're getting uh, the capitals uh, for every country in Africa. What's cool about this is that these aren't just like SQL style joins. These are relations that are defined by uh, this specific um, ontology here. In this case, just the example ontology. Uh, and so this relationships is capital of or is in continent um, could be anything else that relates to your domain. And because it's all really strongly typed through linked data, this makes it really easy to share data and combine data across different types of systems, which is something that these other technologies don't do as well. The response might be this. Uh, we're just getting some records back. And then there's one other alternative, <laughs> which is, you know, you just the raw backing store query language straight to the client. And we might be concatenating some SQL strings or maybe a, a MongoDB uh, a JSON query or something like that at the client level and shipping it straight uh, to the server and back to the database and, and back to uh, your application. And this is what the result of that might look like. <laughs> Don't do that, um, although some people do. But well, one of the things that I mostly don't like about it is that it creates an extremely strong coupling uh, between your, your backing store and your client, which um, is not an architecture that lends itself to uh, change very well. Which brings us to GraphQL. So here is a query on the left from the Star Wars universe. Um, and this is what the result of that might look like. The first thing that we notice is that the query has some common things that are broken out uh, into this fragment. So even though we have two different uh, kind of uh, root nodes in our uh, query, we are able to repeat that same sort of uh, projection of which fields we're interested in on those records uh, in different places. That's really cool. At the language, at the syntax level, uh, GraphQL queries are composable, which means that in your application, you can really easily split those out uh, to map to the component level, for example, or whatever your particular view model is. Uh, and so it creates this really nice symmetry uh, between view models and uh, the type of data that you're getting back. You're getting back only the fields that you ask for uh, and none of, the other, none of the other stuff that might not be needed for your application. It also allows us to really easily have this deep uh, graph traversal. We saw with OData, we're able to join one level to get uh, the friend records, for example. Uh, but with this, we could nest arbitrarily deep. So down here in the friends uh, node, we could select any of the other fields that are available for the friend data type. Yeah, data type. So that's the other thing I love about GraphQL. We have a very dynamic stack. Our application server is in Rails. Our client is all in JavaScript. GraphQL is my sneaky way of making sure that we have an explicit and strongly typed uh, interface at some level in our stack, uh, which gives us all sorts of other wins in terms of tooling. We're able to automatically uh, give a semantic version to our schema uh, so that we can make sure that we don't have breaking changes uh, between clients. 
So the choice of which is most appropriate for your application is going to be based on what type of flexibility you need uh, between your server and your application. If you mostly know how you're going to be asking for things, like give me all the photos for a particular user, if you're doing a lot of kind of um, either basic CRUD or just kind of display types of things, then REST might be uh, a good answer just for its simplicity. And GraphQL is also a really interesting technology to explore. If you're building uh, things that are more analytics uh, and ad hoc query uh, types of capabilities as a core requirement, then you might want to look at some other things that have a little bit more standardized way of doing that. It's certainly possible uh, to do it all in GraphQL, but some other technologies might be better. So I hope this has been helpful in terms of considering which types of API and transport types of technologies you'll be using, especially in this current day and age where we have all these databases that people have been talking about today. And you might also be supporting clients on desktops, on phones, on the web, and IoT, who knows, other things. Thank you very much. <laughs>